Thanks, Brother Jeff. You're welcome. Wow, what a, what a privilege to be here again. Uh, to do, I see new faces here and here, Luke, and, uh, and the kids. You know, I thought my kids were growing. Your kids are growing, too. And uh, I guess that's a progress of life, right? And uh, we get older, and they get taller. Yes. yes. <laughs> so uh, my name is Edward. My last name is Daggett. I'm uh, Mrs. Lamore's uh, son-in-law. Uh, my wife, Joy, her daughter, and that just seeing my, my oldest daughter, Sarah, then Amy over here, we have Ted. We call him Teddy because I'm Edward and he's Edward. So there can only be one true Edward. I'm just kidding. So that Ted. <laughs> and, then, and then Elizabeth, right there. And, and uh, we are so privileged to be here to see, you know, all the faces, Miss, Miss Foreman, Jen, Trish, Norma, uh, Miss Odette. Wow, it's just incredible. Uh, well, we're praying, we've been praying for you guys and uh, know that you guys have been praying for us as well. And what a privilege it is to have a family in Christ, not only in blood, but a family in Christ, where it doesn't matter that I'm from Panama, and you guys are here from Canada, right? We're still family. And wherever we go, when we see another Christian brother, we have that camaraderie in Christ, and, 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 and that, uh, that love that the Holy Spirit gives, you know, and kind of like, uh, I don't know if it was my wife that used to say it, now it's like the angel saying hi. It's the Holy Spirit saying hi to, to himself, right? All right. Well, let's go to the, to the Word of God uh, this evening. And let's go to the book of John. John chapter 4. Now, I don't know what the Lord is doing, but I had another message, and I have it here. And... All, all throughout, throughout the trip, I, I brought a, a book of, with a lot of sermons that I have prepared. And uh, all throughout today, the Lord has been putting this in my heart. And, um, and I know for a fact that God is about to do something tonight. This morning, I woke up very heavy. And with nightmares. And uh, nightmares that discouraged me throughout the morning. And, and, and um, I was feeling like a battle. So we know, like Brother Jeff said, there is a battle that is raging. We don't see it. It's a spiritual battle. God, who is the ultimate winner, and the devil, the ultimate loser, who wants to win, but he can't. Because there's no more powerful than God. He is God Almighty. He's the King of Kings, and He is the Lord of Lords. He is the Prince of Peace. And the Prince of Peace wants to give peace to His children. And if you see in the Word of God, Every single time that the Lord Jesus was ministering, the disciples and the people around him, he was bringing peace to them. When, he was, when, when the disciples were at, at, at the Sea of Galilee and the storm was raging, and the Lord Jesus, knowing what he was about to do, you know, just taking a rest, you see the commotion in that boat. The disciples crying out loud, saying, Lord, don't you care that we are about to perish? And I'm paraphrasing. But he stood up and he said to the storm, peace, be still. If you go uh, in John chapter 16, now this is one of my favorite patches of scripture, but in John chapter 16, in verses 1, um, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, 14. John chapter 14, in verse 1, here the Lord Jesus telling his disciples, 
these words. Let not your heart, what does he say? Be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Do you find the Lord Jesus always bringing calm and peace to his people? And as the disciples here, they're... They needed to hear these words from the Lord. He says, ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many ma man mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Then Thomas, the daughter, he's the, the doubter, he says, uh, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? <laughs> and Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the Lord is preparing himself to go and, uh, and, and, and sacrifice himself for all mankind. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. That means you and me. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we see the heart of the father sending his son, caring, and we see the son, the heart of the son, caring for the people, even in giving himself as a sacrifice. The Bible says there's no greater love than this, than a man put in his life for his friend. That's what Jesus did for you and me. Now, I've posted several scenarios where we see Jesus caring for his people. Now, let me ask you a post a question, and this is the question on this on, on, on tonight for this sermon. Does Jesus care? Does he care? Does he care for your trouble? Does he care for what is going on in your life at every moment of your life? Does he care? For let me tell you something that sometimes as we go through life, sometimes I may say we feel like no one cares. That's right. Now my question is, does Jesus care? Does Jesus care? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the day you've given us. We come to you tonight, Lord, and begging for you, Lord, to show yourself and through your word minister to the hearts or hearts, Lord. We want to hear from you. And I pray that please you hide me behind the cross. Take away my words and put your words in me, Lord. Oh, Holy Spirit, please meet with us. And I pray, Father, that please you just use me. And I pray that please you help us to have the attentive ear to hear what is it that the Spirit has for us tonight. There are many hearts and uh, many, many individuals in, in this place, and uh, we're all different. We're all going through something or have a need from you. And I pray that please you minister the needs in this room. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your son. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and dying on that cross for us, so that we may have salvation and redemption from sin. Thank you, Lord. Please meet with us in Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Now, does Jesus care? And I will answer that question and that sermon right from the top. And the answer, my friend, is yes. He does care. Yes, there is troubles. Yes, there is trials. Yes, there are temptations. Yes, there are tribulations. But Jesus does care. If you go with me to John chapter 16, a few pages there, and we go to the last verse on John chapter 16, in verse 33, we see here that he does care. For he comes and he says here, these things... The Lord Jesus is saying, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world 
ye shall have tribulations. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He cared so much that he told them, hey, listen to me. These words I'm telling you, I am going, you're staying, but don't worry. I have conquered the world. And I tell you these words so that in me ye shall have peace. Just like when he calmed that storm of the sea and he said, peace be still. Just as was when he went to the house of Martha and Mary as Lazarus is dead. And he'd been dead that four days. And he knew he goes up to there and with his disciples. And he knew what he was going to do. That he was going to resurrect Lazarus from the dead. But when he got there, the Bible says that when he saw the multitude. He, and, and he saw Martha. And he saw Mary. Those that he loved crying in pain. He cried. And you have that famous verse that everybody likes to um, uh, memorize. And Jesus cried. Jesus wept. Oh, look at me. Come on. Jesus wept. Huh? But he moved. He was moved with compassion. See? He saw the pain. And let me tell you tonight that whatever is it that it's in your heart and troubling you, Jesus sees the pain, and he says, peace, be still. Now, let's go to John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, there's a woman at a well. And just not any woman. This is a Samaritan woman. Jews and Samaritans didn't get along. They didn't like each other. They didn't have that. They had nothing to do with each other. The Jews wouldn't go to Samaria. They will go around. But in this passage of scripture, we see Jesus. And he needed, the Bible says, he needed to go through Samaria. Let's read. Here in John chapter 4, the Bible says, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself, himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he, listen to this verse in verse 4, and it says, read it with me, and he must needs go through Samaria. There was a need. And he needed to go to Samaria. A place where religious people, the religious Jews and sects, would not even touch. They would not dare go in there. These people were looked as dogs. And they didn't want to contaminate themselves with these people that, look, that, that were dogs. Kind of like... In, in, a, in a sense, we would be because we're Gentiles. But the Bible says that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. He needed to go. Why? Why did he need to go? Then come to, to a city of Samaria, which, which is verse 5, which is called Sikar, and near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob well, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now, pay attention to those words. The Bible gives us the exact hour. It says the sixth hour. That means that that is important. That God knew that he was about to have a divine appointment with someone. He sat on the well. He was thirsty. He had journeyed to Samaria and he's weary. In those days, they didn't have buggies and, and, and maybe the, the emperors, maybe, I don't know. But not, but, but not just regular people, like regular Joes like you and me. They walked. You know, sometimes 
you know, it was a, it was a, a, a donkey, you know. But have you seen a donkey? And have you ridden a donkey? I have not. Oh, and I do not want to either because those guys are very stubborn, right? I'd rather walk than sit on a donkey, to be quite honest. Just say, just me. But he says that time, the sixth hour, verse 7, there cometh at the sixth hour where he sat down, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said unto her, give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy me. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a you, asketh drink of me, which I'm a woman of Samaria? How is this possible? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest, the gift of God. And who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him. And he, listen, and he, listen to this part, and he would have given thee living water. Oh, so we see the exact time. We see a woman of Samaria, and then we see the Lord Jesus giving, giving to her the opportunity of living water. Do you think that was a coincidence? No, it wasn't. It was a divine appointment. Jesus knew she was going to be there and the exact time, and he also knew this, that that woman was in need. We'll read more. And he says here, then see if the, uh, but then the woman saith unto him, verse 11, sir, thou hast nothing to draw, to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank therefore thereof himself, and his children, and his castle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come theater to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. Verse 18, For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sayest thou truly. Hmm. So, now the Lord confronts this woman with her need. The need that every human has. That longing for God. That little piece in the heart that is empty for most people until they get to meet Jesus and get to meet him as their personal savior. This woman was empty. There was nothing that could, that could supply her need for happiness. She had five husbands. The town knew her, the Bible says. She knew the town. Remember before you met Jesus? Do you remember that longing and that empty on the heart? 
I was six years old when I got saved. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. But if it wasn't for a missionary going to Panama, where were we going to go? My mom wouldn't have gotten saved that Saturday. My parents would have been divorced. My dad was a drunkard. And Jesus came, saved my mom. Then eight months later, my dad gets saved. Two years later, I get saved. I know they had longing. Otherwise, my dad wouldn't have drowned himself in alcohol. So men that does not know Jesus are empty and they think and we thought that sin would take care take that place she was a lady with a lot of need won't you say <coughs> then Jesus came let me ask you again does Jesus care If he cared that much for a Samaritan woman, and you already know the background between Jews and, and Samaritans. If he cared that much for her, now how much would he care for you that are his children? If he cared enough to save you, don't you think that he cared for every aspect of your life after he saved you? Now that you have become a children, a son, a daughter of God. See, in John chapter 1, the Bible says that when we get saved and we receive Jesus, that's who we become. John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, the Bible says this. Uh, let me get there myself. He says, he came unto his, unto his own, and this is talking about Jesus. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But listen on verse 12. But as many as received him, have you received Jesus as your Savior tonight? In your life? If you have, he's talking about you. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of of God, even to them that believe on his name. I believed in his name, and I received him when I was six years old. And that day, that Wednesday night, it was a Wednesday night in 1983. That's how old I am. But in 1983, a, mi a missionary, he preached about Jonah and the whale and the people of Nineveh. And he preached about what God was going to do with Nineveh if they didn't repent. And how God was going to destroy them. And how the people of Nineveh, even from the king and to the little child, repented of, what, of their sins. And came to God. And God stayed his hand and saved the people of Nineveh. And at six years old, I understood my need for salvation. I understood that I was a sinner. I understood that I, was, I had lied to my parents. I had disobeyed my parents. You say, as a six years old, yeah, man, everybody's sin. Even the babies, you know? You know, if they're not hungry, what they, if they're hungry, what do they do to you? Huh? They won't let you sleep. No, I'm just kidding. But that day, Jesus came into my heart, and the Bible says that I became a son of God. The day that you got saved, you became the son of God. Not the son of the devil, but the son of God. And if Jesus loved the leper, if Jesus loved that blind man, if Jesus loved Nicodemus, that religious man, if Jesus loved this Samaritan woman, if Jesus loved so much the world that he died for us, don't you think that he loves you so much even to care for you and for me? He does care. He does care. You can comfort. You can get the comfort. 
in his word. You can get the comfort in his promises. You can get the comfort in prayer. Now, we have to seek him. We have to seek him. Whatever is the problem that you have, bring it to him. He'll take care of it. Have he ever failed us? He's never failed us. Sometimes we feel like it, but he's never failed us. Even when the answer is no, he's still there to answer and tell you no. When the answer is yes, yes, we rejoice. But the Bible says that we need to rejoice no matter what. No matter what. Go with me to Romans chapter 5. You've got to rejoice in the Lord. Even in the tribulations, even in the trials, even in the temptations. You have to rejoice in Him because He's there with you. He will never leave you alone. He will never forsake you. He will be with there with you. How many times He promised that in the Bible? You see it in, in, in Joshua chapter 1, how he promised that I will never leave you or forsake you. He, he, he says as in Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10, that with his, that the righteousness of his right hand, he will uphold you. Now, in Romans chapter 5, here the apostle Paul, talking to the Romans in verse 13, uh, let's see. Ooh, verse 3 through 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. It says here, okay, here we are. So I have a Spanish and English Bible, and it is new. This was Dad's Bible. This was Dad's Bible. He left it for me. What an honor. So it's a new tool. It's a new sword for me. But it says here, Therefore, in verse 1, in chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, he says, Therefore, being justified by faith, justified by faith, the moment that we got saved, we were justified by Jesus through his blood. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in what? In hope of the glory of God. We need to rejoice because one day we'll see him. He's coming again. He told the disciples in John chapter 14. We're going to see him. And not only so. Listen to that verse. So we'll rejoice because we rejoice and have the peace because of the justification that we got the moment that we get saved. Jesus justified. And in other words, it means just as if I had not sinned. And then we rejoice because we're going to see him again. He's coming again. We'll see him up in the air. Hopefully we, we'll see him before, you know, I'd rather go that way. <laughs> Just saying. I'd rather go that way. <laughs> right? <laughs> but then, listen, verse 3. So we're, got, we're glory on our scientific, uh, glorification, I mean, justification on the glorification when we see Jesus and he gives us that glorified body and we go with him. But, and not, and, and it says here in verse 3, very important. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. This is the part that we don't like. This is the hard part as a Christian. Right? Right? But remember what he said in John chapter 16, verse 33, that he already overcame the world and that he's there to give us peace. And now here in Romans chapter 5, in verse 3, Paul is telling the Christians in Romans, because they were going through a lot of, they were going through perse persecution and harsh persecution there at the center of the Roman Empire. And, uh, and he says, and not only so, there's not glory only on those things, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope make it, and hope that make it not ashamed, because the love of God 
is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So guess what? He left. And he's in heaven preparing a place, mansions for each one of us. Mine is going to have a three-story and, and a little what, slide going all the way down to, uh, to because I'm diabetic. So over there, I'm not going to be diabetic, right? So it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a, a huge ice cream bar with a, with a chocolate fountain where I can dip it. And then I have a cone with ice cream sundae. Better than McDonald's. And, but he's preparing that for us. He's preparing a place for us. Oh, it's going to be so awesome. Watermelon. Oh, come on, brother. That's good. I'll, I'll come visit yours. But I tell you, I tell you something. So he went and prepared a place for us. And he told us not to worry. He said those words to give us peace, right? And then in verse 5, there, that was, as we read, he has given us the Holy Ghost to dwell within us. The seal of our salvation. The comforter. And that and him who will give us all understanding of the word of God because he bears witness of the word of God. He is in you. So let me ask you one more time. We have, we have painted that picture already of all the blessings that we have, that he has given us, and that he had not left us alone. Does Jesus care? What do you think? Yes. He does. Whatever he said, that your heart needs minister, he's there. You can come to your father. You can kneel and you can pray and you can beg, Lord, help me through this. Lord, give me your peace because you are the prince of peace, isn't he? Just as Peter, drowning. Man, he was a brave dude. I, I'm brave, but not that brave. I am afraid of sharks, and I don't think that the Sea of Galilee have sharks. But I don't know that. So I wouldn't step out. But Peter did. But when he started seeing all the waves, the situation, the circumstance where he put himself into, <laughs> it's like, whoa, whoa, I think I beat too much here, Lord. And then all of a sudden, you know, he takes his eyes away and he's drowning. I said, oh, oh, I'm in trouble. I don't know how to swim. I'm pretty sure he did. I don't know. <laughs> but he sees that and he starts crying out, Jesus. And I believe that before he even said the word G, he was already there. And he grabbed him by the hand. Do you need the Lord to grab you by the hand? I do. I do. And you know what? He cares. Does Jesus care? Yes, he does. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the time that you have given us, Lord. Thank you for speaking to our hearts, for speaking to me, Lord. I needed this. And Father, I pray that please you deal, you know, with the needs in this room. And we come to you. And thank you for bringing us, bringing us peace and giving us that uh, 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 reason to rejoice. Even on, on tribulations and on trials and temptations, Lord. We sure don't like it, Father. That's the truth. We sure don't like it. But thank you for that promise that you have overcome the world already for us. And that you will give us peace. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Ghost. And thank you for comforting us. 
your Holy Spirit. We love you. And we thank you. In Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. One, before I leave, just one more thing. And I forgot about this. So throughout, throughout, the, throughout this day, in the past couple of days, I've been going, I'm dyslexic, so please bear with me, okay? But I've been going, I love books. It's just sometimes it, it takes me a long time to read books, right? But that has a lot of books. And, and mom knows that the very first day, I'm like, like, a, like a kid in Christmas. Like, wow, 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 you know? And, uh, but I came across this book. It's an All Smith Treasury Hymn Histories. And I came to one of the, the hymns um, that I love. It's called, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. Have you ever heard that song? No one, that was dad's favorite? Oh. Whoa, whoa. So, Al Smith, uh, he interviewed the, 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 the writer of the song. His name, the writer of the song is Charles F. Wiggle. And he asked him about this song. And he says this, uh, Charles F. Wiggle, he, he goes, he, say, uh, he says, Uncle Charlie's, I, I, where am I? Oh my goodness, please bear with me. Who, who's a good reader here? Who can read, who can read? Lizzie, you wanna read? Come, 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 please. <laughs> hey, it's a long read, baby, so this is my right youngest here? one. Right here, right here, right here. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. This is the story of it. Go ahead, go ahead. Charles F. Weagle spent much of his time as an intern, as an itinerant evangelist. It was not an easy life, but a rewarding one. I first met him on the campus of Tennessee Temple University in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I had often sung his songs, and now I have the chance to ask him how he had been led to write, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. I felt there had to be something special connected with his writing. Here is the story as it was told to me by Uncle Charlie. As I have been, I, as I, wait. I had been actively engaged in evangelistic work for quite a few years. To some, it may have seemed like a life of sacrifice, but to me, the reward of seeing souls saved was worth more than money. God had given me a definite call. I was obeying him, and he had promised to keep me and supply all my needs. In all of this, I thought I had the support of my wife, but somewhere along the way, she began to be influenced by relatives who cared not about the things of the Lord, nor understood the calling of God. One day, I found a note waiting for me. It said, Charlie, I've been a fool. Oh, you got to speak louder because, so that people, nobody can hear you. I, I got you. I got you. Okay. 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 I got you. So, so he says, he says, so I'll, I'll read from up here. So, so these... Uh, Mr. Mr. Charles, he was an evangelist, right? And he said, I had been actively engaged in evangelistic work for quite a few years. To some it may have seemed a life of sacrifice, but to me, the reward of seeing soul safe was worth more than money. God had given me a definite call. I was obeying him and he had promised to keep me and supply all my needs. In all of this, I thought I had the support of my wife, but somewhere along the way, she began to be influenced by relatives who cared not about the things of the Lord, nor understood the calling of God. One day, I found a note waiting for me. It said, Charlie, I've been a fool. I've done without a lot of things long enough. From here on out, I'm getting all I can of what the world owes me. I know you'll continue to be a fool for Jesus, but for me, it's a goodbye. Uncle Charlie's eyes filled with tears as he told the story. He continued, the bottom of the world seemed to fall out at, the mo at that moment, for I love my wife very much. I found her and tried to reason with her and pleaded with her not to go through with her plans. 
but it was to no avail. One day, as I sat on a porch of a cottage in Florida overlooking a lake, I felt so depressed and forsaken. I thought, why not end it all? Your work is finished. No one cares whether you're dead or alive anyway. Why not walk off the pier? But through the appalling gloom of that moment, there seemed to flash, there seemed to flash a voice in my soul that said, Charlie, I haven't forgotten you. Charlie, I care for you. Let not your heart be troubled. I threw myself down beside my chair and asked the Lord to forgive me for not fully trusting him and promised that come what may, from here on out, I never again let such a thought cross my mind. I began serving the Lord again. At first, it wasn't easy, for some folks did not understand the situation and were reluctant to use me. But slowly, the Lord began to heal this hurt. Also, and soon, I was again busy for the Lord. One day, I received the sad news that my wife had died and under very heartbreaking and tragic circumstances. She had had less than five years in which to try the world, and eternity had begun for her. What did the future hold for me? It was while reviewing the heart-rending experiences of the past three years, and the past three years, and reflecting upon the goodness of, and love of the Savior, who never forsook me through it all, that there was rekindling me in my soul the desire to write a song. This song would be the summation of my, my whole life experience with this wonderful friend. It was a story the whole world needed to know, and it came to me as fast as I could put it down. It was the first song I had written since the day my world seemed to fall apart. Now, I wanted the whole wide world to know that no one ever cared for me like Jesus. I said, Uncle Charlie, was it worth it all to go through the heartache and heartbreak? Don't you often wish that it had never happened? His reply, I'll never forget. All Smith, it is not for me to question the testings, the testings of the Lord, no matter how hard they may seem to be. God, in His love, knows what is best, and someday he'll tell me why it all happened. Until then, I'll go on singing and telling the world that no one ever cared for me like Jesus. And the song goes like this. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus Since I found in him a friend so strong and true I will tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms around me. And he led me in the way I ought to go. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. And the last stanza. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love. 
but I'll never know just why he came to save me till someday I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. He cares. Amen. Amen. Brian Jeff. Church needed that message. Wow. <laughs> Praise the Lord.